Hey. Hey, Hi, how you doing? Good. This is totally random. I just got home. It's a rainy day. I saw you were streaming, so I thought, hey, why not just jump in? So there you go. Oh, welcome. Yeah. Uh, everyone, this is Caleb. I've known Caleb on the internet for years. Has yeah. a channel you should subscribe to. Probably one of the, oh my goodness, how would I describe you? <laughs> Mad genius. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, like just the amount of like he can just go when I mean, he gets on a topic. So if you want to learn about a lot of uh, current events, um, things like that, just and from a very particular like communist perspective, Caleb is a good source. Thank you. Well, I've been I've been watching you for years. Like I said, I remember when I first started watching your channel, it was like a decade ago and you would read like Trotsky books like out loud. Right. Isn't that how it was, if I remember correctly? Sometimes. I mean, I've read a lot of different stuff out loud. I don't know if I read any Trotsky, though. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. I, mean, I think I, I read some of his writings about fascism because we were doing a study group, like, years ago, and some of his writings were on that. So he had some interesting insights about the nature of fascism that we read. Um, I wish I could remember the book. Maybe if I look it up, I could recommend it. Hi, Keith. Welcome to the chat. Oh, and thank you for, oh, thank you for wishing your condolences to me about sure. Fred was his name, Fred Hyde. You can look him up. He had quite an interesting career as yeah. a radical. Yeah, so you're in Portland these days? Indeed. Well, I've, yeah, I've remained in Portland. I left for a couple of years when my father was pretty sick, but um, I'm back and I have been since 2016. Oh, well, next time I'm in the Pacific Northwest, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to let you know, but yeah, no, I've been, I've been watching your stuff for years and you still come up on my, uh, my notifications and I got a not notification. So I thought I'd hop on. Uh, you talk a lot more about, um, uh, like tarot cards and, and mystical stuff these days, right? That's kind of a theme on your channel now, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a thing, though, anymore. I just try to do whatever I'm interested in doing. So sometimes I'll feel like, oh, this would be an interesting reading for the public. Or sometimes I've done just for, uh, like, zodiac signs. That's a pretty popular thing. So I did a few of those for a few months last year. And, um, yeah, some mystical stuff. I mean... Really, it's just whatever I feel like talking about. A lot of it's just, I mean, how would you all describe my content? It's a lot, it's a lot of just my perspective on things, hmm. too. So I talk about topics that are important to me from my life as well. Great. Well, what's the weather out, out there in the Pacific Northwest like these days? Um, well, let's see. We had every type of weather today. Um, we had rain in the morning, and then it was windy, and then we had sun, and then it was partly cloudy. And I think it's pretty clear now, actually. I think the skies have gotten a little bit clearer. There's a little bit of clouds. No, when I was out there last, I actually, I had not been there since, like, I went to Seattle once when I was, like, a kid, you know, a long time ago. And I had not been to that part of the country. So I asked the people that I was with, I said, tell me about, like the culture of the Pacific Northwest. And they said board games are a really big deal in the Pacific Northwest uh, because it rains so much. So people are indoors, right? And also because Mormonism is a big influence out there. There's a lot of Mormons and Mormon Mormon culture. Like they, it's something about they play game board games together. That's part of the Mormon thing or something. Um, so they said board games is a big part of the culture of the Pacific Northwest. But what would you say is is the culture out there? Like what what makes you know, you know, Oregon, uh, Washington state, what makes it unique? What makes it get, what, what vibe does it have? You know, when you think of California, there's the California vibe. You think of new England, there's the new England vibe. What is the vibe of the Pacific Northwest? There's a few things that come to mind. Um, I would say Portland is very different than Seattle in terms of vibe. The people here are a little more down to earth. Um, people here are very radical, very, Portland is a very um, 
forward thinking, progressive kind of place. Like it's always trying to be on the cutting edge of thought. So it does produce a lot of um, interesting writers, I would say, have come out of the Portland area specifically. Um, here, the DIY thing is still pretty big. Mm. Um, the concept of um, trying to create communities that are outside the mainstream is still pretty big. Um, obviously, uh, we do have a pretty big protest culture as well. So, I mean, we're known for that. Uh, I was pretty proud to be from Portland during like 2020 because <laughs> we were on the news almost every night. <laughs> and I wasn't even involved, but I was like, yeah, that's where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember the Battle of Seattle when I was a kid. That was oh, a yes. really big deal. That was, and I was quite young at the time, but I remember my grandparents had a subscription to Newsweek, I think it was. And on the cover of Newsweek, I saw like people in black masks, like smashing windows or something. And uh, and I remember reading at the time, I didn't really, I mean, I was just a kid, right? I, I had just learned like what a communist was. And so then I was reading in the um, in the, the Newsweek, I remember reading that like protesters against capitalism in Seattle who are anarchists. I'm like, they're anarchists, but they're against capitalism. So are they communists? Like I thought anarchy meant no government. And I just remember looking at the pictures of the Battle of Seattle in 1999 when I was like a fifth grader or something and being perplexed like what does this mean uh so that was that was um that was my memory of the Battle of Seattle when I was a kid do you remember the Battle of Seattle oh it was a big deal those were the anti um world trade organization protests and that was like the first time you saw on mass the um tactics I guess you would say or yeah, I mean, their tactics, protest tactics of like actually targeting specific corporations and like smashing windows became the thing. That was the time it became big. It hadn't really been a tactic in the US in the same way before that. Um, and it was just, it was such a big deal as well. I mean, the number of arrests and just the chaos that ensued so, I mean, yeah, that was in Seattle. So I do think there's some of that in the Pacific Northwest, regardless, it does have a rebellious air. I mean, a lot of, I'm reading uh, currently, I know you've read this book. We talked about Anna Louise Strong before, oh, yeah. but I'm reading her biography, I Change Worlds right now. Great so book. there's a lot of, you know, history in this area and specifically in Seattle of like, just uh, really strong, militant, working class organization and um, rebellion. So I, I think that's in Portland, it's to a lesser extent here because I do think the culture here is more anarchist because people are more individualistic here as well. What about I, Eugene? There's a place, Eugene, Oregon. What is that? I've heard people refer to that. What is that? So that would be, Eugene would be like where the green anarchists congregate, the people who are against civilization. I mean, we have those here as well, but yeah, that would be kind of like the hippie anarchist types, like crusty vegan types. And also, they, I mean, Eugene is also, it's a college town, so there's a lot of football uh, fanatics you know, for the state. I think that's where the ducks are located and that's the big team in the state. Or there's two, there's like the beavers and the ducks. So that's a big deal in Oregon. But I feel like Portland is very different than the rest of the state, honestly. Okay. It's very, it has its own culture. And a lot of people across the state do not seem to care for Portland or Portlanders very much. Okay. It's because I, I would say that there are a lot of them are very backward and they don't understand living in a civilization or a city. <laughs> also, um, Anna Louise Strong, you know, that book, I Change Worlds, is, is really a great book. Um, I started reading Anna Louise Strong when I was in high school because I found somewhere online a PDF of her book, uh, The Stalin Era. And I read it and I was particularly moved by it. Um, you know, her account of the five year plans and socialist construction. But I read I Change Worlds in high school and I remember just really liking the optimism in her writing. You know, she's very, very uh, hopeful. And 
and there's also like, you know, her father was a minister and her background, like her college thesis from Oberlin is all about like prayer and the power of prayer and stuff. And that even though she obviously became a communist atheist, there is this very like religious, dedicated vibe you get from her writing. Like in that book, um, you know, I Change Worlds, she talks about being right in her soul. Like that's a really big theme. Like, and there's actually a biography of her called Right in Her Soul that someone else wrote. And that there is this kind of like religious like American optimism that flows through all of her writing that gives it a particularly uh, unique, you know, vibe. And when she talks about Americans being motor minded and how like the American spirit is alive in the Soviet Union, I mean, this is not, I remember when I read it when I was in high school, it was not what I expected a communist to sound like, but it also seemed really, really familiar. You know what I mean? Like it was really, really like, you know, she went to Oberlin College and like I have ancestors who were founders of Oberlin College, right? And that it's like, she was from that like John Brown, like radical Protestant American speaking truth to power tradition. And that flows through everything that she does. Even though she was, you know, in like the Marxist Leninist current, she had that kind of very American uh, Protestant, optimistic, moralistic view. And, and you get that in a lot of the Maoist kind of writers. Uh, William Hinton. He was from a similar trend. I believe his father invented the jungle gym and like his parents started one of the most like uh, prestigious boarding schools in New England, the Putney School. And for some reason, the Maoist current kind of there were a lot of like kind of New England radical types that were attracted to Maoism, which is interesting. Marxism often attracts kind of people that have more of a, you know, they're about like they're they want to, you know, F the man. They want to tear things up and all of that. And, and the Maoist current oddly there was an element of attracting kind of people with this kind of like idealistic New England, you know, puritanical kind of thing. Have you noticed that? Do you get that vibe from her writing? Um, I do think that the way you've described it is very accurate. Yes. I mean, I do find and what I like about her particularly is the optimism and actually about American radicalism generally, honestly, because I've spoken to people in other countries who say how much they admire like a different American radical traditions. And then I'll, I'll probe them about it. I'm like, well, who are some of your influences? And they'll tell me about like being inspired by the Black Panthers or, or being inspired by like um, just different currents of like the labor movement throughout the American history. And this is stuff that people around the world know about. Just like Anna Louise Strong is very famous in various countries, but she's very buried in American history, despite what a big deal she was and how much actual work she did here prior to, you know, immigrating and working in the Soviet Union and in China. I mean, I just, yeah, there's something, there's something very, I think just, I don't know how to describe it exactly about Americanism, but I, I've really appreciated it compared to like reading. Cause you know, when you, when you get kind of interested in these subjects, you want to read Lenin, you know, you want to read like, um, well, I read like Trotsky or, you know, Stalin or whatever you want to, you want to go to these sources, but then to actually read an American, somebody who's from your nation, who you can relate to in some ways. That's what I find about her work and like even her poetry itself is like, I don't know. It's just, it's, she's relatable. Even though she was like, often I'm like reading her poetry. She wrote like over a hundred years ago at this point, it's very fresh. It's very relatable. It's from this region as well. So it feels like kind of electric in the air. I was just, and I was also thinking now too, she just reminded me of like Jack Reed as well. So, cause he and what Louise uh, Bryant were both from Portland or I don't think originally he was from Portland, but they lived here for a while, actually not far from where I am now. <laughs> so <laughs> just up the street. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing that I, I find about Anna Louise Strong is, I mean, you won't read this in I Change Worlds because that was published before World War II, but, you know, she was kicked out of the Soviet Union because Stalin thought she was a spy, right? And so she was, like, deported back to the United States. And then when McCarthyism set in, she was obviously an outspoken communist. And so, like, for the 50s, like, 
throughout the 1950s, she was like ultra canceled. Communists wouldn't speak to her because they thought she was a spy. And Americans hated her because they thought she was a communist. And so like she had like no friends whatsoever. The communists had turned on her and the American, uh, everyone who was like not a communist had also turned on her. And I, and I feel like how hard that must have been for her. And like she couldn't work as a writer. She couldn't work anywhere. Luckily, her family had some properties. And so she was able to make money through like real estate. I guess, you know, she she was she was well off. So, I mean, luckily, she didn't starve on the street. But it was like that period, the 50s must have been just a nightmare for her because it was bad for communists in general. But imagine that the communists also think you're a spy. You know, and they don't like you. So communists wouldn't speak to her and, you know, average people wouldn't speak to her. She was just kind of completely canceled. And then when uh, when um, when when Stalin died, suddenly she got like, you know, they announced they were wrong about her being a spy. And that was seen as a favor to China for some reason, which is very odd. Right. I don't know what that was about, but it's like Khrushchev or somebody said, well, she wasn't a spy. And then that was, and then all of a sudden China would talk to her again, but Soviets would never talk to her again. Like it, it was weird. It was, she was in with China, but she, but the Soviets, they had cut her off. And I, and people speculate, I've heard theories that like she was in China or she, she was reporting from China during World War II and that they saw her as too sympathetic to Mao and they didn't trust Mao or something like that. But there was some internal stuff and she was like too pro-China and not, not, you know, not close enough with, with uh, with the Soviet Union or something, but it was it's a, it sounds like a very hard life that she had. Um, and then uh, one of the other incidents that's very interesting is she lived her final years in in China. The CIA put out a fake version of her newsletter. All of her fans in the United States, she would write this newsletter to them, and the CIA wrote one of their own and sent it to all her fans that she didn't write. And that's a wild story, also that 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 all of her fans got a, a newsletter that was supposedly from her that wasn't from her. Right. And it was all about like how, you know, the main focus of communists should be to focus on opposing the Soviet Union because they're the main enemy or whatever. And she didn't say that. And she actually then sent out another letter to her fans and said, I never wrote this. This is and the CIA basically just sent a fake letter out trying to stir up all of her fans against the Soviet Union. That's a wild story also. Like there's many layers of, of weird uh, and, and fascinating really in her life. I mean, she's quite a person. And Zhou Enlai, the Chinese foreign minister, was like her personal friend, like came over to her house many times. And, you know, um, you know, that, I mean, she she was quite a dynamic individual if there ever was one. See, this is what I'm talking about, y'all. Caleb can just go off, <laughs> you know, so much. Um, OK, Aaron, what? No, I'm not seeing the chat. Should I turn the chat on here? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't see anything. So there you go. I can't see the chat. So okay. I don't know who Aaron is. So I, oh. he says war starts soon. If you're not your okay, Aaron, come on. If you're not on SSI Medicaid or Medicare, you'll have to be drafted. China started enlisting March seventh. Russia just invaded of Ukraine. Okay. I don't know if I want to go there. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if they're going to draft people or not, but I'll just tell you that uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, if it came to a direct confrontation between the United States and Russia and China, I can I can tell you who would win and it wouldn't be the United States. Uh, you know, I mean, as much as as much as I love millennials like myself and our Zoomer younger folks, I really don't think they could face off against an army of Russian and Chinese folks. I just not going to happen. You know, maybe maybe they're better at PlayStation. You know, if it's just a drone war, they could like play play PlayStation and that would be like their their background. But uh, I'm, I'm just being honest. I don't think uh, I don't think our our uh, our young folks are going to win in a war against the Russians and the Chinese. Yeah, I don't think I'm I'm gonna get drafted either. So I think everything will be okay. <laughs> yeah, you and I are old enough. I mean, we we yeah. we're old enough that we don't have to worry about it. So well, I'm also I'm also physically disabled, so I'm not gonna get drafted. I mean, what am I gonna do? Run into someone? <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, and I I I I would probably if I wasn't, I would probably do the you know honorable thing and go to prison for you know refusing to fight. Yeah. Due to moral objections. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I mean, at this point, we have an army of green card soldiers. I mean, it's people who want to get their citizenship from South America. You know, that's the main recruiting of the U.S. military these days. So I can imagine they would just up the benefits. You know, suddenly they'd give you, you know, lots of money on top of your green card or something like that. That's probably what they would do. It's a lot like the, nice. the Roman Empire. You know, in the final years, the Romans couldn't get their own army together. They had to just hire, you know, right. other other people. And I think that's what we're we're heading towards. But. Aaron has got a very dark uh, perspective there, but honestly, you know, a direct confrontation between the United States and Russia or the United States and China. I mean, that's nuclear war. That's World War Three. And I think both both sides will do all they can to avoid that. Yeah, I, I honestly think this is just, a, you know, at least from what, where we're sitting, I don't think anything like that's going to happen. It would just be mutual self-destruction. So I just don't see it being... I just, yeah, I don't see that. But, you know, I, I was alive during the first Cold War, so. <laughs> there you go. Hi, hi sweetheart. Hi. Um, eh, war. I don't want to talk about war. This has been horrible. This whole situation has been horrible. I don't. <sighs> yeah. Well, don't what else are you reading these days in addition to Anna Louise Strong? Um, well, I'm reading uh, Sigmund Freud's Totem and Taboo. Ooh, I that one's read that nice. <laughs> What's that? I haven't read that one. I've read Civilization and its Discontents. And some yeah, of that's a good one. But tell me, I I, I re really enjoyed. There's a book called uh, Freud and Marx: A Dialectical Study, and you can find it online. And it compares Marxism to Freudianism. And it quotes that book in particular a lot in the analysis of like primitive communism right. and such. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious. What are you learning from that book? Well, he, the, I honestly, I only read a few pages at a time because I get so, he is at the point that I'm at really analyzing, um, I guess, what they would call primitive societies. Uh, but so he's talking about a lot of different cultures and the different taboos and customs they have around these taboos. And um, it does remind me a lot of reading angles is like the origin of the family, private property and the state. So in terms of like discussing that, but it, it doesn't, it, at least it hasn't in this where I'm at yet gotten into any, oh, I shouldn't say that exactly because they do talk about um the origin of like totem and clan systems and how incest is basically prevented through these systems. I mean, it isn't completely perfect, but um, yeah, so a male couldn't breed with anyone uh, who shares the same totem as him. That's like the first one. Um, and interestingly enough, now it's starting to get into taboos in our modern culture. So right, the last part I read was, um, what was it last night? I don't know. Um, right now it was about rulers. So taboos around rulers and having these kind of um, different points of leadership in between in order to separate people from rulers because there is a taboo around um, getting too close to those who are <clears throat> in positions of leadership. Yeah. So I, I thought that was interesting. He's talking about like how people can interact with like a minister, but interacting with a king would be like considered taboo yeah. or it's only done under a certain circumstance. And so you have these um, different positions as kind of go-betweens. So I, that one, I, I'm kind of wrapping my head around more. Interestingly enough, too, we talked about uh, taboos around. Uh, one of them kind of I thought was interesting, like. Um, specifically, like women with infirmities. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting, just having a disability myself. So I was like, OK, that's interesting. Um, Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to get into that, but I was, I, I thought it was like, hmm. Yeah, well, there's some interesting ones, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I do like Freud's work a lot. So I will say that there's obviously it's not complete, but nothing is. 
Yeah, well, no, I, I get a lot out of Freud as well. And I feel like he really has gotten not a fair shake because it's like everything that that Freud that we think of when we think of Freud is like the cringe, like gross stuff about, you know, toilet training and sex and all of that. And but then all the stuff that he thought of that that was that we now use, we don't give him any credit for like talk therapy. He invented talk therapy like, you know, like if you ever do any talk therapy, which is a really common thing, that's Freud. And no one goes, wow, Freud's the you know, smart guy who invented talk therapy. Everyone says Freud's this crazy guy who talked about pooping and and wanting to screw your mother or whatever. And it's like that's it's not fair. You know, we, we think of the cringe, gross, over the top analogies. We don't think of the stuff that like the idea of a subconscious. That's pretty universal now. Right. That, but that's Freud. Like no one said that until Freud came along. But we don't give him credit for that. And um, and that's one thing that I feel like, you know, we popular culture, I guess, has just not been fair to him in that regard. The other thing was that um, that Freud probably, in my perspective, was not a good person. He was probably a sociopath to some degree or other, I would suspect, because, you know, he was a bit of a predator and there's many examples of that. But that doesn't invalidate his work. If anything, that it, that gave him this kind of and that comes across in his writing, this kind of like um, emotionless uh, ability to just kind of coldly calculate things. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and and that makes it useful. You know, it doesn't mean he was necessarily a good person, but it, it it makes his work more insightful. I think if he was emotionally wrapped up in things, if he had the kind of empathy that he should have had, uh, his work wouldn't have been as powerful. What do you think? Well, I I I don't know about calling him a sociopath. I do know that there is a lot of controversy. I can't remember which feminist writer introduced me to this about him exactly, but his work was a lot more empathetic and at least at the beginning. So like there's a, a case study of Nora, which is like this, his one of his like most important works where he discusses this neurotic young woman. And um, he had, a lot of cases of just a lot of women with neuroses basically coming to him, telling him basically that they've been sexually abused wow. or like victims of incest. And so he was publishing this work and he actually was basically informed he needed to stop doing that because people weren't going to keep they weren't going to keep funding his work if he went down that angle because mm. we like even though it was a lot of the source of like the neuroses and these women and particularly in like nora's case for example what i remember and i may be not remembering clearly because it's been like 10 years since i read that work but <clears throat> her father was having an affair with his friend's mother mm. or not mother his his wife he was having an affair with his friend's wife. And then so she started receiving sexual attention from the this friend of her father, mm. whose wife was having this dalliance with her father. And she believed that that was intentional, done by her father, like she was being kind of given as, you know, some sort of outlet or, or whatever to make up for this arrangement. I'm not going to get into all the words. Wow. But, um, so, I mean, this is a mild case, but anyway, like he, this man, he like, he, he had like kissed her. He had like done things to her. And essentially in the writing of this case study of Nora, he basically convinces her that the attention she was receiving from this guy, like the, the inappropriate touching, the kissing was not, it was like made up basically. Mm -hmm. It was something that she was fantasizing about. Mm -hmm. So I think that was pretty um, kind of reading that story and then like reading this kind of feminist perspective on it. And then also seeing that prior to this story, he had been publishing research showing like the prevalence of incest for example on um, actually causing a lot of neurosis in the culture um yeah that was that was kind of devastating but it's like how many great thinkers in order to put forward 
their work actually do end up having to self-censor, mm-hmm. which is what I see that he did. He ended up self-censoring. Um, I think too with like sociopaths, I always think about that, like how how great it would be. <laughs> like it would just be such a relief. Well, like go through life and like to just see things maybe sometimes like without that filter of yeah. being emotionally invested and like being able to I, I guess in some ways just pure rational rationality Constantly. yeah another thing that i get from freud and this is an interesting one is that you know freud and carl jung they cooperated freud was jewish and carl jung was of a, of a christian background and they had very different writing styles Right. And that you could argue that Carl Jung's writing style was much more, you know, much more like narrative, whereas Freud's style was much more polemical. And people say that's very similar to Marx and Engels. Marx wrote in the polemical style, whereas Engels, you read Engels, it's much more of a narrative style. And um, people compare that to like if you read the Bible, the Gospels in Christianity, they're like just narratives like this happened. But the Talmud is. A polemic. It's like, you know, the, the Talmudic, uh, the rabbis argue with each other. And that back in a time when there was no television, like what holy book you you read growing up had an impact on your your writing style as an adult. And that, that Freud was very open about the fact that like Carl Jung took Freud's ideas and made them like accessible to a mass audience. Whereas, you know, I mean, Germany was a largely Christian country and, you know, Austria the same way, but but, you know, but but Carl Jung could write in a style that like a wider a wider audience could could understand. And a lot of people say that about Engels also like Engels. He wrote, you know, Engels is much easier to read than Marx. But maybe that's not true if you grew up reading like, you know, rabbinical Talmudic polemics. Right. And that that um, that, that those kind of styles and and that that kind of impacts things. And, and you can see this throughout a lot of different genres like art and music of like a Jewish person and a Christian kind of teaming up and, and, you know, often the Jewish person will have the ideas, but then it'll take like a Christian person to present them to the wider audience in a way that, that the audience can understand. And you see that throughout Europe in these times, like the Victorian era and such. And I think that's very interesting. And it speaks to how like culture and, uh, you know, literary background can really have a big impact on things. Do you think there's anything to that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, I actually just read a book by Young. I don't, I didn't like his writing style very much. I have to say, I prefer reading Freud. So mm. I don't know if that's. I mean, I have a Protestant background myself, so I don't think, I, I don't know what that means. I think too, I prefer writing that is more. I guess uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. You were describing it as polemical versus narrative. I think I would probably prefer like the polemical writing. So, yeah, but I didn't, well, the book I read too had a lot of anti-communist stuff in it too. So I was, you know, giving a little bit, like as I'm reading it, I'm like getting the little hairs coming up like, oh. Well, didn't Carl Jung eventually, he became a Nazi, right? He was a card carrying member of the Nazi party at one point, wasn't he? I can't verify that. I'm going to have to have a fact checker on that. I don't okay. know. I heard that, uh, that, you know, Freud was obviously, he just fled Germany. He left. Well, the yeah, country. he was. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. They, yeah. they didn't, they, they, yeah, they destroyed his work actually. Like wow. he, he was one of the uh, writers that they burned, which is, per, which to me indicates that he has value. Hmm. Like if fascists are burning it, you should probably read it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, I think like within our modern culture, it's interesting to how Freud is like dismissed or considered irrelevant or just like, um, you know, out of date when in reality, what I see presented as modern psychology is like very much just very watered down and not, you have to go to the root of things. Now, what do you know about Wilhelm Reich? Do you know Wilhelm Reich? Oh, I haven't read Wilhelm Reich. You know, I have a friend who talks about him all the time, and I still haven't (laughs) read any of his work. Yeah, uh, Criselda Pacheco. She does. She actually has a YouTube channel as well. So she does. Her work is kind of. um, 
how would I describe it? She specifically works with people around uncovering their true natures. Mm. And so she ties in a lot of different things, but like Reich is something that she has. uh, She does courses with people basically. So she'll take classes and she'll take in a number of students and she'll work with them. And she has them read Reich specifically um, as one of the readers. I tried to read Mass Psychology of Fascism by Wilhelm Reich, and I found it to be ridiculous. I mean, just just downright absurd. Uh, you know, um, I mean, he's he's arguing that the in the in, inherent cause of Nazism is sexual repression, right? That that is what Nazism is about. To the point that he argues the swastika is two naked bodies, and it reminds people of like two naked bodies laying on top of each other. And that the, you know, the, the Nazi salute looks like an erection. And it's, it's like that level of analysis. Like everything the Nazis do is somehow secretly turning people on. And Nazism is caused by parents not letting their children masturbate and stuff like that. And that's why the Nazis are coming to power. And Freud looked at this and he said, this is complete baloney. This is the stupidest thing I've ever read. And the Communist Party of Germany also expelled Wilhelm Reich for writing it. And they said, this is ridiculous. And and so Wilhelm Reich, you know, fled Germany and he moved to the United States. And then he was at he was at New School Um, and eventually Eventually, Wilhelm Reich, you know, he he had his own like group in the United States um, and he was talking about UFOs and space aliens and all kinds of stuff. And eventually the U.S. government broke apart his organization um, and they were particularly harsh and nasty to him. And he, he was imprisoned for uh, for violating the Food and Drug Administration's laws. Um, it's kind of a wild story, but I mean, I, I personally, I see Wilhelm Reich as just a flim flam man. I mean, I, I started to read mass psychology of fascism and I thought this book is so ridiculous. You know, this, this is just, and it, and, and I was surprised to see that mass psychology of fascism by Wilhelm Reich is actually cited by Theodore Adorno in his authoritarian personality as like a source. And I was just like, are you, are you kidding me? Cause I tried to read mass psychology of fascism. I'm like, this is just the silliest book I've ever read, but there you go. But what is, what does your friend take from Reich? I don't know. I'm currently looking uh, for the book that she has them read from actually just to get uh, more perspective on it. So Maybe it's a documentary. I don't know. It's not coming up here. It's, I'm not. Well, there still is some kind of incident. Mm-hmm. This in- looks interesting. Oh, what is it? Wilhelm Reich in Hell by Robert Anton Wilson. Mm. That might be something for me to read. <laughs> well, I mean, he maintained quite a following in, in New York City and in, and in the United States. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think fascism is caused by sexual repression. I mean, I think in some respects yeah to a certain degree that there is an element of it inherent i mean it's necessary for fascism in many ways but um yeah he seems to be big on the sexual revolution yeah and kind of was uh looks like a pivotal thinker in that i haven't read any of his work so i'm not gonna continue well he had a a group called sex it's the murder of christ that might be it. That might be what she goes off of. I think that might be it. Yeah. I okay. So, yeah, that sounds like the most familiar. Yeah. Mm. No, he had a group in Germany before the Nazis came to power. He had his own group. It was called Sex Poll, and they would um, they would go door to door selling contraceptives at a time that that was you know you know not allowed. That was like a stigma. They would go door to door selling contraceptives and pamphlets about contraception. Um, and his group sex poll was considered to be like it was a group fighting for sexual freedom or whatever. And then they merged into the German Communist Party briefly. And then he wrote his mass psychology of fascism book, which everyone thought was was ridiculous. And then then he moved to the United States. He was kicked out of communism and kicked out of of psychoanalysis. And he just kind of had his own following, but he maintains quite a following. I mean, in New York City, there's a Reich Institute that that meets, that has events and stuff. And and 
the, the way the U.S. government came down on him was particularly harsh. I mean, they burned all of his books. And I mean, it was like it was like he did clearly. I mean, he violated the Food and Drug Administration's rules. He was selling people machines that he claimed had medical value that didn't and stuff like that. But the way they came down on him and burned all of his books and destroyed all of his records of his experiments and stuff, that was a little bit much. And that that's what raises questions about, you know, was it unfair repression? The other thing is he may have been an influence on L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, many people have speculated because L. Ron Hubbard was around those circles, uh, you know, in New York City. He was hanging out with William Allenson White, um, and he was in the psychoanalytic circles of New York City during that time. Uh, and that some of the ideas that Reich was putting out, like, you know, about like, you know, space aliens and, and spirits inside your body and stuff sound a lot like Scientology. And I've heard people speculate about that, that, that uh, it's very possible that L. Ron Hubbard developed a lot of his ideas by, by kind of looking at Wilhelm Reich and copying him. Um, so there you go. Yeah, I haven't read any L. Ron Hubbard myself either. There's well, so there's many books I have yet to read. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think if I've read anything else, I mean, I usually read a couple books at a time because I get bored. I'm reading um, Martin Luther King Jr. too. I'm reading um, a collection of essays by him. It's actually behind me. I keep forgetting the name of it. Um, I grab it. Is it called, let's see. Got a couple books here. Uh, in a single garment of destiny. So yeah, it's a lot of speeches on global justice, essentially. So there's a lot of speeches given in other countries by him, stuff like that. So that's interesting as well. Yeah. <sighs> well, the last book that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote called Where Do We Go From Here? That is a very <laughs> radical book. You got I, it in front of you. Next. Yeah, that's my next one. That was actually what I was looking for. They didn't have it when I went to the store initially. So I just picked up this one. And then I was like, you know what? You want that book. So I ordered this one, found a copy of it on some website, and then came to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe second sale, they have some pretty good. I can usually find a lot of stuff through them, but I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, well, lots of stuff. Are you reading anything good? Well, right now I am kind of overwhelmed preparing for our conference, March 25th and 26th. That's mm -hmm. kind of my focus. I just finished writing the book I that I wrote for the conference. My new book just came out. It's called, Where is America Going? Uh, and I, I just, uh, just finished it and released it. And everyone who comes to the conference in DC will get a free copy. And I was kind of racing to finish that book. I've had, the, I've been working on that book for years. Um, it's kind of the culmination of stuff. And so I finished working on that and now I'm trying to put together my presentations, uh, for the event. Um, and I'm doing that. I also am working on an article mm -hmm. about the destruction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. I'm, I'm finishing up an article on that. Um, and I'm also hearing a lot of people are contacting me and asking my opinion about the Silicon Valley bank crash that happened today, which I don't know enough about to comment on, but people are saying that's a really big deal. Have you followed that? No, I try to avoid, um, the news as much as possible. Yeah, I didn't, I haven't heard about it, but a lot of people are like, oh my God, the Silicon Valley bank crash, this could be the beginning of something. And so I feel like if I, you know, I'm very interested in economics, so I need to find out what's yeah. going on. Silicon Valley bank crash. Yeah. What bank? What banks? I I I haven't looked into it. I haven't had time. I've just gotten texts all day. Oh my God, Silicon Valley Bank. There's a bank crashed in Silicon Valley. This could be the beginning. This is 2008 all over again. I've been getting texts like no, that. All just, people, so. Why do people have to get like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. This isn't 2008 all over again. It's a whole new thing. Come on. <laughs> First time is tragedy. Second time is farce. Yeah. Exactly. Roku says 26% of its cash revert reserves are stuck in Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, okay. So it looks like this is impacting some various corporations and quite a few stocks. So 60% yeah. stock wipe. I mean, this happens, you know. This is the way the market is. Yeah. I don't, I mean, 
Yeah. It's, it's that everything is financialized, you know? Mm-hmm. In China, in 2015, their stock market went down by like 60 points in one day. And if that happened in the United States, there would be riots in the streets. The electricity would go off, like food would stop being delivered. Like if our stock market went down that dramatically, it would be like an apocalypse scenario, okay? In China, their stock market went down 60 points in one day and nothing happened. And then the, the Chinese government was like, oh, we need to fix this. So they called up all the uh, all the major shareholders basically and told them if they were caught short selling, which is betting that the stock would go down, they would be arrested immediately. So they outlawed short selling so no one could bet on stocks to go down. And then they froze the, the selling of stocks in all state run industries. And then the next week, the stock market was right back up. And like less than 10% of the population in China is in any way tied in with the stock market. So like even if their stock market completely tanked, I mean, it wouldn't be good for China, but it wouldn't it wouldn't have the impact. They're not financialized in the same way we are. Everything in the United States is tied in with the stock market. And that is a disaster. You know, we used to have this law called Glass-Steagall that separated commercial banking, uh, you know, from uh, from from private banking, meaning the banks couldn't, you know, invest your money on Wall Street. And Bill Clinton basically got rid of that. So now if you have money in a bank, it is being, you know, gambled on the stock market. I mean, it's it's pretty ridiculous. So that's the situation we're in. Well, <laughs> like I said, I try to avoid the news as much as possible because if I can't do anything about it, it doesn't help me to know about it or worry about it. Well, let me say you have a great view from your apartment window there. Thank you. I'm looking out the window there. Is that People like- People always say that. They're like, oh, and if the lighting's a little bit different, they say that my view or like imagery here reminds them of one of those lo-fi yeah, playlists on YouTube where chill out to or study to. Mm. I do have a nice view for the most part. I mean, there's some, I, if I were a little bit higher up, it might be nicer, but it's pretty quiet and it's nice and urban. I do get to see people come and go. Sometimes I recognize the people I can see out there. So, and I, yeah, I'm pretty happy here. I'm a nice little balcony. I can go out and watch the neighborhood as well. And then from there I can see down the streets and it's pretty lovely. Well, it looks very peaceful. For the most part. I mean, it is Portland. So there often is, especially down this street, there's a few old folks homes. So there's often like uh, ambulances that come through or just different things happening. So occasionally you'll have the sirens come through but i don't hear them that much there's not the walls are pretty thin in my apartment complex so i hear my neighbors but i don't hear outside hardly at all there you go it's very muffled so it's pretty nice especially for being as low as i am like i'm on the third floor here so it's it could be a lot louder well, very Thank, good. yeah i do enjoy my view hopefully okay. they'll put something in where some of the shops got closed this year, um, year, so I'm hoping they'll put something in soon, but who knows? There's so many empty places still in Portland. It's really, I'm sure New York is, I haven't been back since, what, 2019, right before the pandemic? Yeah. I'm yeah. sure it's grim in a lot of places. It is. It is. Also, um, you out there in Portland, you have a great musician, David Rovix. Do you know David Rovix? Uh, of course I know David. He's amazing. I love his yeah. music. When great. I was in Radical Women, he actually uh, volunteered. He did a free concert for us. We were wow. doing a fundraiser. So well, that he, was really awesome of him. Yeah, we had him at our CPI National Training School in Linda, oh. our, uh, our musician. He was there for a couple of days and, and led singing. He's a really great guy. Um, yes, he is. And he's a great writer, too. Yes. He, has, he puts a lot of his writings up on YouTube in like a podcast style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go subscribe to his channel. It's good stuff. Yeah, David Rovix. You know, he um, yeah, he's going on tour soon as well on the East Coast, he said. Very good. So I haven't seen him, though, in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I've not seen him live. I 
he, he, you know, he's been faced, he's faced a lot in Portland as well with like the cancel culture. It was so interesting. You were talking about Anna Louise Strong getting canceled. <laughs> I don't think it, <laughs> it's, it's a real issue. <clears throat> It is, you know, and I. It's a real I, issue. Uh, the fact that he's getting it, and he hasn't even done anything. Yeah, I. I you mean, don't need to do anything, though. That's the thing. Yeah, and I mean, I've been, I've been hit pretty hard with it, and I, I mean, I, anyone who knows about me and what I do for a living, and you know, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious why, um, you know, and you know, what's sad though is that um, you get people who don't know anything about you, like nothing. They know absolutely nothing about you. And they think they're an expert on you because they saw one little hit piece or they saw one video or something. And I find that to be very frustrating. And it's the same with David Rovix. You know David Rovix. I know David Rovix, right? Maybe we don't agree with him on everything, but we know who he is. And these people who don't know anything about him, well, they read his name in an article and they're like, oh, that guy's a nut. It's like, he's he's not that. Like, you know, and it's like, and if you if you know who I am, you know I'm not a white supremacist or a Nazi or anything like that either. And but it's like these people, they they think they're experts, and it like makes them feel special. The other thing that I I find particularly annoying about cancel culture uh, is that you get people who can't understand that this happens to anyone, anyone who becomes like a really outspoken anti-imperialist or whatever, you get canceled. Right. That is just what happens. And there are these people that can't get it through their minds that that's what happens. Like they have it in their mind that somehow, you know, if you if you're canceled, it's your fault and you're just no good. And it really reminds me of the people that are against every socialist country because they have it in their minds. There's going to be a socialist revolution somewhere. And The New York Times will be like, well, you know, that's OK. Like it won't be accused of violating human rights and be accused of being an evil, repressive regime. It's the same kind of mindset. Wherever you have socialism around the world, it's going to be called evil, Stalinist, authoritarian hellhole. Whenever you have a, a, an anti-imperialist, left-wing activist voice in the United States, regardless of whatever mistakes they've made, and I'm not perfect, and you know David's not perfect, I'm sure, but, but they're going to come at you with this. And that there are people that are very prominent that are pro-imperialist that get away with all kinds of things, and no one cares, right? They, I mean, I mean you know, Pat Buchanan, for example, right? I mean, he's the main conservative voice. That guy has written articles defending Hitler, like blatantly and saying that World War II, Hitler wanted peace. World War II was the Soviet Union's fault. All this stuff. I mean, you know, and he's still on MSNBC as they're just, they're conservative. He's Pat Buchanan because he's mainstream, right? And that that's, you know, cancel culture is very selective in how it's enforced. The other thing is, you know, you and I have been doing socialist stuff for years. These bread tubers, and I wrote a whole book. I really made them mad because I, I I wrote my book about bread tube. But you know, you've been going to socialist conferences. I have. Have you ever met ContraPoints? I never have. Have you ever met Vosh? I never have. Have you ever met ThoughtSwap? I never have. These people. I will say one thing about ContraPoints because I knew ContraPoints Ooh. back when the channel was Nicotine Two, and these were like the early days of YouTube. Yeah. And that individual was highly disrespectful towards me. Um, in a chat, and it was particularly around the subject of pornography because I was very outspoken about that issue just because that's what I got sucked into at that time. Mm -hmm. Regardless, um, yeah, he, he thought it would be funny to send me um, like pornography and ask me if this is pornography, like just like probing me, make, like thinking it was like a funny thing to do. Uh, really? The other thing about this, the other thing that bothers me about that channel, and obviously I've been canceled for m multiple reasons for over the years, so it's just something that I've dealt with. But particularly, the way that ContraPoints presents as an individual is overtly sexual mm -hmm. in a way that if a actual female was presenting on YouTube would get flagged immediately. If I were to come on or any other woman were to come on wearing lingerie, that would get flagged. And it's very irritating to me on, on a number of levels. The fact that I was personally disrespected in the way I was. Well, that's individual. And sending someone porn is sexual assault. I mean, that's. I mean, it's, yeah. it's yes, it's it's. And the, this, he was like a teenager at the time. So like I can forgive someone for being 
an idiot. But the fact is, the um, this individual is just not. <sighs> These people are not who they say they are. I'll just say that. These people are not genuine people. What's interesting, not though, working is that class people either. Contrapoints didn't come out of nowhere them. then. That's interesting because it's like a lot of these people just came out of nowhere, but you're, you're telling me this person has a history kind of on the yes. internet. I mean, I, yes, but this individual, like, I mean, the, this person does have a history. I know they went to Northwestern as well. So it was likely got sucked into things there. And honestly, I mean, a lot of what ContraPoints does is very mainstream, so it's going to get traction. Yeah, well, Hillary Clinton likes her, right? I mean, that was the latest. Uh, that's, right? that's a nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah, Hillary Clinton did a special, and I saw this, and I'm just like, really? and then people make fun of me. I, you know, I, I was provided with information about how Steve Hassan is advising ContraPoints, right? Dr. Steve Hassan, who was a kidnapper, Right. The cult deprogrammer guy from the 70s that, you know, who's got links to American intelligence that he was advising her and other people. And so I wrote the book Bread Tube Serves Imperialism. And then Gray Zone discovered that Abigail Thorne is directly funded by the British government uh, and the British royal family. And like, a, you know, so and that was revealed. So it's like what I wrote, I I had the you know, the, I had you know, a close to smoking gun that there was some intelligence support for bread to because of Steve Hassan. So then Gray Zone finds an act, finds receipts for British government support. But people still continue to make fun of me and like, oh, he thinks everyone who disagrees with him is CIA. Oh, oh, oh that's ridiculous. And now and now, like Hillary Clinton gives the endorsement to ContraPoints. Like if if Hillary Clinton is endorsing you at that point, you are a voice of the establishment. You can't get more establishment than Hillary Clinton. So it's like, and and these people, they just they just laugh it off. And then Abigail Thorne began her next video after Gray Zone revealed that Abigail Thorne is getting British government by saying, just so everyone knows, this video is paid for by George Soros. And then laughing it off. So, and it's like, these people can't make up their minds. Does George Soros exist or not, right? Because he clearly exists. But if you ever, if you mention him, they just say, well, you're being anti-Semitic or they make a joke about it. Like, oh, George Soros. But then she begins her video by saying, just so everyone knows, I'm being funded by this this person that we often say doesn't exist, or that anyone who mentions him is anti-Semitic. I mean, it's it's very clearly that that out of the blue, because there was so much interest in socialism because of Bernie Sanders and all of that, they created they they picked five or six people, you know, to be the voice of socialism on the internet, and and they picked them, and now we're all just supposed to get our politics from them, and they happen to love the FBI. And they happen to love all the, the wars the U.S. government is waging. And they happen to think that socialism is just an employee stock ownership program. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's basically instead of, uh, you know, getting a wage, you just get a, uh, you know, a share of the profits. You get a, you know, a stock dividend as your payment. That's what they think socialism is. And, uh, and we're just supposed to accept them as the voice of socialism. And if you don't, you must be a Nazi. I mean, it's 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 kind of infuriating. You know, I was into socialism. And so were you when it wasn't a cool thing to be into when it was actually like a, an anti-imperialist movement. And now uh, they've scrambled to try and keep control of it. And I'm curious as to what's going to happen, right? I mean, it looks like based on what I'm seeing and what like Saturday Night Live is doing and the way, you know, Bill Maher is now on CNN, they are getting ready to have a Republican president, uh, you know, like a, like a more establishment Republican president, like a DeSantis win in 2024 to be like a revolt against wokeness because so Amer so many Americans are tired of wokeness, they're tired of the cancel culture. And so they're gonna have like a fake woke, you know, fake anti-woke uh, president come in. That's what it looks like to me and it'll be staged and it'll be criticizing wokeness on the most superficial level. They won't be political. They won't be opposing the wars. They won't be opposing any of the stuff that you and I are mad about. It'll just be like, a, aren't you tired of being PC? And they'll, we'll get a Republican in there. That's what it looks like to me. Because it looks like that's the way things are blowing, but who knows what could happen between now and 2024? What do you think? Well, um, I tried, like I said, I tried to avoid the mainstream politics because it just it isn't do good for me, and I, I'm not really involved in any politics myself anymore. Actually, just because of this this kind of stuff, yeah, is so I I have to take care of myself. Yeah, honestly, I'm 
I have too much going on. I don't believe that I need to put myself in danger anymore, quite frankly. And that's what it was coming to. Like I was consistently putting my head up against a wall, you know, and at some point you have to choose your own life. Um, so that's kind of where I've just departed from it. But that being said, it's like from people's fruits, you'll know them. Mm. If they're pro imperialist war, they're pro war generally. I'm highly suspicious. You know, I anytime there's an invasion anywhere, it, it just it doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense, and it it very much is clear to me that I, I agree with you that there are people that are selected to basically be controlled opposition. That's what's going on here. It's just it's the same thing. The political situation in this country. It's a way of keeping people from becoming too radicalized because they know that people are on YouTube looking for people who think, people who read, people to instruct them. Um, so if you can select people who are, what I would say is um, malleable or um, able to kind of put forward the narrative that is just in alignment with the status quo anyway, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you look for these people that are not really offering anything that's a solid alternative? Um, I mean, to me, it's just about kind of taking all that energy, obviously, and directing it into, you know, something that's gonna end up have people voting Democrat, you know, at the end of the day. And, and supporting like the war in Ukraine. I mean, that's that that kind of drove me nuts. I think I got off of social media at that point because just seeing the Ukrainian flag everywhere was so jarring to me. I was like, I can't believe we're here. I mm. really can't believe we're here again. To have all these people who never cared about any of this suddenly so invested. Yeah. Also not having any context about what's been happening leading up to this point for the past you know decade at least with russia and the ukraine it's just like <sighs> anyway i mean trent says biden has destroyed america <laughs> oh my goodness I, I feel it. It's very, it's very infuriating. Um, but I also, I have to think like, what am I, what are my goals here on YouTube anyway? Okay. I just want to be creative and I want to share and people have to dig if they want to find, you know, things that are real. Yeah. That's, the well, end what, That's it, you know? Yeah. I mean, we at the, um, we at the Center for Political Innovation, I'm trying to build a community of people who like the ideas that we're putting out and, you know, we just will, we will exist on the margins. We will be, you know, canceled and locked out to some degree or other, but we're going to keep organizing and we're going to support each other as a group. And that's what, what I'm aiming to do at this point. Right. I, I realize that, that, you know, because of who I am and because of where I've been and because of what I do, we're, I'm not going to be allowed to penetrate mainstream spaces. Uh, but I am going to build a community of people who are dedicated to the ideology that I believe in. You know, because really, I would not be alive right now if it wasn't for Marxism and socialism and communism. Like, that saved my life. It gave me a reason to be. It gave me a purpose. It, it got me from Ohio to New York City. It got me from New York City to Iran and from Iran to Russia. And, you know, it really it really gave me a purpose in life. And so I, I just feel such an attachment to it and it's such a part of who I am that for me... And I get a lot of people that say, well, Caleb, don't organize. Just be like, a, you know, just be a social media personality or just make a video. Or I can't do that. For me, politics has always been about an organization. It's always been about building a, a group to do something. And if I were to not be involved in any activism, I don't understand what the point of my writing would be. Right. It's all about building a community, building a group. And I just I can't envision myself not doing it. I do realize that my the way I'm going to do it is going to be limited because of, you know, the way things have developed and what I've been subjected to. But that's OK. And if people want to work with us, they're welcome to. And if they don't want to, they they don't have to. And uh, 
and that's that, you know, and I just, we're going to continue doing our thing. I'll continue putting on conferences, writing books and, and, you know, making friends with people and having our little community and trying to figure out how we can make an impact and eventually set the stage for what eventually needs to happen. I mean, eventually, you know, we're going to have to move towards socialism in this country and U.S. imperialism is heading towards more and more of a collapse every day. But, you know, until then, we have to we have to have a realistic sense. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's one thing Freud talks about is that part of maturing is becoming aware of your own size. Like a baby thinks it's the most powerful thing in the world because all it has to do is cry and it gets fed. It gets, you know, but, you know, as you as you grow up, you become aware of what you are really capable of. And that I've noticed that a lot of communists in America, they have this double think where on the one hand, they think they're Lenin. They think they're the vanguard, like they're leading the new revolution. They are the one true revolutionary. On the other hand, they say, oh, there's nothing we can do. We can't do anything. There's no hope. And it's like neither of those things are true. You're not Lenin. You're not, you know, the new Bolsheviks. You're not on the brink of leading a revolution. But at the same time, you're not powerless. There are things you can do that can make a difference. So the art of being a revolutionary in our times is finding out what is it that you're capable of doing and doing it and doing it well and doing it better. And that's that's really what all of us have to figure out. What are we really capable of doing? What can we do and how can we do it? And to not fall into delusions of grandeur or delusions of, of you know, of irrelevance and, and hopelessness, because everyone can do something but also don't have an overblown sense. And I find that, that uh, have you noticed that the communists have that dual, that dual delusion of, of being absolutely, they are the one true, the main thing, and oh, we can't do anything. Have you noticed that? It's weird. Uh, I, I don't know how to even get into that, honestly. But yeah, there's, I've noticed it. Definitely, I, I even notice it myself to a degree. Like I had to really get very real with myself at a point in my life. I'm like, okay, I don't know everything. My life needs to, that, like I said, I had to really start to focus on my own life because it was in shambles because I was letting this and like the way the world should be kind of overtake the way the world is mm. to a certain degree. So I think a lot of people at the same time, they kind of like uh, cripple themselves because of that mindset you know they don't actually allow themselves to fully develop in as individuals because um yeah they have that conflict within themselves about their inherent rightness and the fact that things should be a certain way even though they're not and so they aren't doing what they can with what they have in front of them yeah and so i think that's that to me it was uh Kind of a big awakening when that kind of came to me realizing that i needed to even though i have a lot of skills that other people don't particularly one thing i hadn't really realized that was so powerful about me was that i read because i hadn't i thought everybody did <laughs> yeah me too i thought everybody did and i was like everybody oh did. people people want to hear from me because because <laughs> I continue to educate myself throughout my life. Like I didn't stop educating myself when school was over, you know? So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, where to even begin with it? I don't know. I mean, for myself, I'm just trying to live the best life I can right now and do what I can for the people I can. Um, and also, I think too, um, I mean, you've talked about too, how like Christianity informs, you know, your perspective as a communist. So, I mean, that for me has become important in my life as well, kind of being part of that and doing that work in a church, you know, setting. Oh, wow. So, What's yeah, on? American Baptist. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Same same uh, denomination as uh, Martin Luther King Jr., which is why I've been kind of revisiting his work specifically. Um, so that to me, that's been important as well, seeing kind of the importance of also using the church as a tool for social justice in the country and for meeting the needs that aren't being met. There we go. There's the lights I was talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No sirens though, so that's good. Yeah, you know, meeting needs where the government isn't. Yeah. So um, 
that kind of is where I'm at, like with my work as an individual too. But um, I, I think organizing is essential. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's good that you're still organizing. I'll say that. Like, if you can organize, you should. Well, thank you very much. Well, listen, yeah. I can probably get going now, but thanks for bringing me yeah. on, letting me just hop yeah. on here randomly. Uh, I'm glad I saw you in my <laughs> notifications. Uh, so stay strong out there in Portland. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'll, I, I'm often watching. Mm -hmm. I don't always make myself known. I often lurk in your stream. Oh. So just because I don't say hi doesn't mean I'm not watching. So mm -hmm. around. Uh, and I, I wish my best to your audience. Uh, very good. Yeah. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.